Welcome to the Rough and Ready Lockdown Session. I'm going to be plugging in my microphone and welcome you to Lockdown Never Lockdown seen a truer colour in the sewers, gutters, who was cut us loose and who was losing trust. What? Just assume they want us to resume with Satan, throw us in the face of danger while remunerating. Your stable genius is brains a penis. Your deep thinker's a bleach drinker. No way, we're serious. Brexit flag and exit planning while we're still on stretchers hanging. Ventilators dragging. Valentine to dress to mammon. Foreigner despising. Pocket nine and profit hiking. And the bottomizing anyone who prophesied it. Heads in investments, credit bonds, better lives away, hegemon, bowed heads before the hegemon, lives wasted, discarded for blind faith in the market, in the one car wreckage looking for ways to restart it, stigmatized, didn't quit the second I love Never seen a truer colour in the sewers, gutters, who was cut us loose, who was losing trust. Please grab Just yourself. assume they want us to resume with Satan, throw us in the face of danger you. while remunerating. Mm. Your stable genius is brains a penis. Your deep thinker's a bleach drinker, yeah, and away from serious. Brexit flag and exit planning while we're still on stretchers hanging, ventilators dragging, Valentine to dress to mammon. Foreigner despising, pocket lining, profit hiking, and the bottomizing anyone who prophesied. Woo. Heads in investments, right, we got a credit bonds, better lives away, hegemon, bowed heads before Please the hegemon, the word. lives Please wasted, share. discarded for blind so faith in the market, in a car wreckage looking for ways to restart it, stigmatized, didn't quit the sick and dying, death to the death, but heard immunized. Sycophants, sick of answers, sick of deliver rule, living, sitting in taxis, plan to leave us sicker with the vaccine. Power praising, craving cowards, counter claiming, thrown us in the overcrowded house and leave the sour tasting. Protected sectors never in protective vests and medics and just sent them in with empty gestures. Fake breach and labor leak and weaponize and secret hate speech and racist feeding. Hoarding trinkets, gorge and misreporting inconvenience that's ignoring. We can see it all recorded. Opportunists jacking prices, casualties ain't stacked up right. Wait, the true colors might be black and white. Messengers shooting, deflecting questions, wedded to weapons and fuel and considered a few deaths a solution. Yes, people. I hope uh, we've got a few more people locked in and tuning in. Um, needless to say, if you're texting me at this point in time, I won't be responding because I'm live on the interweb. I hope you guys are, are managing to hold your mental health together. I think um, this sounds extreme, but I feel that like there's been an assault on our physical safety, um, obviously with the coronavirus and the failure to respond to it in any way that we would have hoped for as normal people, but also an assault on the mind. I've been saying this for a few weeks in the lockdown, that when you just see a picture of Boris Johnson in a mask, but it's not accompanied with any clear public health guidance, it feels like it's just supposed to make us feel all on edge and not know what to do next. And therefore, when the spike, second spike inevitably happens, Boris and Dominic won't get blamed for it. Call me a cynic but I managed to counter my cynicism with jazz. <laughs> I hope everyone's feeling good this week. Uh, I'm gonna play a song before I, as I said, give you this fantastic news I've been building up to. And what I'm gonna play, I have no idea. <laughs> I'd like us to get into the, well, we probably are, if you watch this, you might be on your phone in the park, but I want us to get into the vibe of, uh, fun time. Sounds counterintuitive, I know, but we do have stuff to celebrate, we have life to celebrate. Providing the saxophone celebrates giving you a Let's match the set now. Check it out. 
going for the Jimi Hendrix effect. <laughs> being told that the voice is very quiet so that's always bad when that happens I like my voice I want it to be loud I hope you can hear me and uh, I'm gonna play one more let's do this oh yeah Oh, 
I'm happy with this sound. Definitely couldn't do a show. A music show without sound. That would be really whack. Yeah, man. I hope everyone's feeling good out there. I don't have a drum roll sound effect, but I do have gratuitous cloud, crowd noises. Provided they're working. Okay, now I can't hear anything. Uh, is everyone out there? Is anyone out there? Ecam, you're doing it to me again. It's been great. But I can't hear any sound effects at all. Alright. I'm gonna hopefully check in with my Facebook group, play a play a video one time and just quickly check in to make sure that everybody is uh, tuned in before we uh, make this big announcement that I keep talking about. I don't need a sound now, but uh yeah, not the sound that I'm looking for often. One, two, one, two, one, two. this uh, poem for those of you who have heard it enjoy it again for those who haven't it's red terror black peril fever time the masses need dividing race myths and reams of lies still sit beside the feet of a defeated kaiser so you must be the virus keep inside the screams and violence hate adrenalized keep them on equal feed and misleading lies feeding people to demonize it's all a sequel secret ties they keep the skies so we can't see the sky Street sirens never seem to see them silent off the leash and leaderless iron string stealing wire. Look, see, they're stealing wives. As the seasons wind, keep them blinded, flightless, feet binded, all at sea, they don't deserve a seat. Keep them sleeping in styes. Keep them uniting, keep them striking, you don't meet the legal requirements. People penalized never seem to see the prizes or read the signs. Heard in the new sheets and wireless. Chief advisors, hmm. elite assignments never seen to creep and sneak behind them. Just dreaming of the beast Poseidon, ports and crisis, sailors reside beside the sea, never seem to see the wider horizon of the sea beside them. So roll, roll, roll your beads of violence, heaving, climbing, black, lethal creatures, increasing crime. You people need to stick to cleaning, sweep the dying, repatriate, tell them leave, we need peace and quiet. Heathens, disease has seized their minds, so it's red terror, black peril, fever time. It's red terror. Black Peril, fever time. Yeah, yeah. Apparently, some people can hear fine. Others can't hear a single word. So I'm going to talk right into the little bug mic and maybe try and turn it up even further. Hopefully, um, yeah, man. Ah, oh, great. Thank you, Paul. Nice. I think that says clear. Ledio clear. Loud and clear, I suspect. <laughs> but thank you so much for tuning in. I've got some incredible news to share with you, beautiful people of Facebook, and for my loyal homies and homettes. For those of you who've been tuning in basically every week um, for something like 20 weeks now, 19, maybe something like that, I am going to be taking both the concept of these lockdown sessions, flyover shows and stuff that I've done before, and the Black Peril, and uh, curating and creating a live online festival called Black Peril 
2020. And I think it's probably best if I just play this to introduce the concept to you if you've not heard of it. This is all about Black Peril 2020. Join me online for Black Peril 2020, a new way to stage and participate in a festival. We won't be in the same room, but it affords an even greater degree of intimacy and a deeper way of engaging with the themes and the ideas behind the Black Peril. Every evening between the 14th of September and the 18th, from 7 p.m. till 10, we'll be broadcasting bespoke performances from five cities in which race rights took place 100 years ago. Hull, Salford, Liverpool, Cardiff, and London. Throughout this summer, British bridges, streets, and squares that were once the scene of violent race riots in 1919 will be transformed into dynamic stages, plinths, and galleries to creatively explore this past. It's easy to get the erroneous idea that today mobs of woke millennials are forcing society to confront diversity for the very first time. However, from Glasgow to Barry, and indeed New York to Chicago and Toronto and Italy, over a century ago, the Western world was engulfed in racial conflict. As venues throughout the UK are still sadly facing lockdown, I'm excited, however, to be able to bring you album content and live footage on a completely different platform. Myself and an incredible list of artists, academics and activists are responding to these conditions of lockdown and also the questions of how racism and structural inequality in the past have come to define our present. At multiple historic sites up and down the country, we'll be performing and engaging with this history of racial conflict on British soil over a century ago. I'm going to be joined by some incredible people. Kehinde Andrews, Low Key, Nicholas Payton, Jason Moran, and many more. An incredible array of established and emerging voices responding to this century of racial animus, but also this very current moment of attempting to overturn and deconstruct white supremacy and structural racism. Decolonizing the curriculum, the white working class. Black on black crime, deconstructing whiteness. Karen's gone wild. Western exceptionalism, the red terror. We want to go beyond the sound bites, the hashtags and the clickbait to bring you something truly revolutionary. Featuring artists such as Robert Mitchell, Jay Phelps, Zosa Cole, Nathaniel Cross, Nick Jurd, Sonia Konate, Hannah Mbuya, Grifton Forbes Amos. There's a truly stellar lineup of dancers, including Tyrone Isaac Stewart, Theon Campbell Davies, Stefano Ade, Tanea Martin and Mason Connolly, Caramel Soldier and many more, curated and choreographed by the incredible Jade Hackett. Filming and videography by Toby Isadol. This past week I've been in a preliminary site tour across the UK and it doesn't really hit you until you're on the actual streets mentioned in the historical record. But although Britain cosmetically has been transformed over the past century, many of the same attitudes and inequalities have stubbornly persisted. This 2020 vision and the hindsight that it affords has brought a level of clarity to things this year that wouldn't otherwise exist. Last year I got to create, debut and release The Black Peril with so many incredible guests. But this year I get to take the project, its energy and its ideas back to the streets that inspired it. With such a relative paucity of first-hand accounts of black life from inside these communities, you can often only conjecture what it must have been like to straddle these radically differing perceptions of nationhood and humanity. You can only imagine the feelings of betrayal and terror, as well as courage and vaulting ambition that defined the lives of black Britons a hundred years ago. That reimagining is where Black Peril 2020 comes in. See you there. Do come and join me and be part of this incredible online spectacle. And I think it gives us an opportunity to drill down into some really serious conversations, some important conversations, hopefully some stabilising conversations. And this online festival will be different to the offline festivals in some important regards. Like We can really 
get behind the thematic inspiration for the album and talk to some kindred spirits. Mention some that you may not know who are incredible people, low key, uh, and an independent artist who defines what that really means in 2020. Um, I was lucky enough to support him a couple of years ago, a year ago, and lines of audiences around the block, sold out shows up and down the country, but he's never on mainstream radio. And that in itself is noteworthy and conversation worthy. How some people have massive audiences, but are not considered household names. Kehinde Andrews, Scourge of Piers Morgan, <laughs> Haranger of Gammon, Mighty Slayer of Ignorance uh, is going to be joining me and we're going to be chopping it up in great depth, hopefully. There's so many times that um, we have just passing conversations and I'm really looking forward to drilling down into the substantial, important lessons from race riots 100 years ago. And then we've got our international guests that I'm going to be talking to. Jason Moran has created an incredible work as a homage to the Harlem Hellfighters and James Reese Europe's music. If you don't and are not familiar with James Reese Europe and the Harlem Hellfighters, do research it because it's very much connected to this history of the emergence of black music alongside race riots and social unrest associated with black people. Um, and of course, Nicholas Payton, my brother, who I really, really enjoy streaming and seeing him uh, chopping it up on Instagram every other day. But it's the creator of BAM, certainly the uh, one of his chief architects. Black American music has existed, of course, before Nicholas Payton. But the idea of an encompassing term that is not genre specific, that doesn't keep us in the jazz ghetto, is both an important contribution and a controversial one. So I want to get inside genre with Nick and where we are as black people across the diaspora. Where does American exceptionalism figure? If race riots were happening in 1919 in New Orleans and Liverpool simultaneously, in New York and in Cardiff simultaneously, in Kingston, Jamaica and Taranto, Italy simultaneously, and somehow we've been sort of refracted as an international movement. Um, yeah, I think it's just a very, very exciting time. I don't want to get too uh, sidelined in all this convo and, and waste it, you know, ahead of the festival. But I really, really, really want you to come and uh, to be a part of that where you can. I'm going to try and have some little background music. That's what I'm trying to do right now. One, two, one, two. I, it sounds a bit like foreground music still. All right. Bear with me, guys. Thank you for your patience. Like last week, my Ecamm stream was perfect. And this week, it told me to upgrade and do some stuff, and it's just being annoying. But life is annoying sometimes. <laughs> I had some very, 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 very good talks um, with people today. Two in particular, and it, it all just, everything seems to synchronize at the moment. I don't know if you're having the same thing with synchronicities, but I'm definitely noticing that my personal conversations and friendships chime with the the projects that I'm doing, the wider contributions and conversations that I'd like to start. And uh, I'll start off with what happened to me at Halfords, actually. I was just going to get a receipt for a bicycle lock that I needed, um, just a standard, standard day. And you guessed it, there was this sort of microaggressions turned macroaggressions. I walked into a shop with six people, all working but not making any eye contact. Six people in Hal Halfords, uniforms and looking away, looking down, just kind of not acting busy, which, which happens. So I walked over and said, good, good morning, I was promptly ignored. And then she, she smiled, very laboured, almost theatrical smile, and then <laughs> said, yeah, go over there. So then I went over there, just bearing in mind, I just needed a receipt printed out and said, so can you help? And he said, yeah, after I've helped this man, this gentleman, there was a lot of animus and just venom and vexation now. You know, if I try and tell people about this, as is most of the past years of my life, then they think you're a bit crazy or a bit, you know, hypersensitive. But what I'm noticing is people are getting angry. They're getting angry because of the state of lockdown, a lack of clarity from government, and they're looking for people to blame. My study of history, the Black Peril, and my recent travel up and down the country suggests if it happened then, it can happen again. And it's something that we should all be very, very mindful of, this slide into 
getting the government off the hook and finding new scapegoats. And the new scapegoats are the old scapegoats. That's black and brown people, poor people. Ways of shouldering the blame so that those who are really responsible are never really held to account. So you know what? Quickly, I didn't really get time to do slides and stuff, but I want to just show you where my frame of mind is more generally on this whole, this whole situation. Changing the background track. All right, um, if there was a charge sheet and we put the parliament government on the dock, then uh, I think it would be a very interesting situation right now. The light's gone out, but you can still see me, right? Hopefully, good. And if there was a, a punishment that I'd meet out to government, it would be that the UK as an entire country, if we're not careful, will collapse under the weight of its own hypocrisy. So let me explain this rather extreme thesis. If there were charges, let's just keep that in mind. If there were things that we want to level at government for failures over the past four months, I think it's important to sort of itemise them and list them for ourselves. The government are basically murderers, either by design or by default. We're looking at the prospect of 120,000 excess deaths throughout the winter if there is a second spike, not to mention the 45 to 60,000 people who've died and the numbers around that are incredibly vague. With the fifth richest economy in the world, Cuba has 100 deaths, Vietnam virtually none, so it didn't need to happen. Charge number one. PPE stock was out of date by 10 years. Charge number two. Three, Boris Johnson himself told us to go out shaking hands because that's what he did right early on in the crisis. There's been a comprehensive lack of tracking and tracing anywhere and instead a dodgy handing of these contracts to Tory mates. Um, they sent patients into care homes like nukes into a nursery. We all saw that and then tried to blame the care, the care workers. 20,000 people, over 20,000 black people have been stopped and searched in London. That's equivalent to a third of the young black population of London itself. 20,000 stop and searches during lockdown. There's been a spike in racialized arresting, even after the murder of George Floyd. We've been bailing out billionaires. We've been giving money to bit rich, <laughs> funny Freudian slip there, to rich CEOs and they're just going to use this furlough money to pay themselves whilst laying off workers. We can all see that happening. And the government has given vague and contradictory advice from start to finish. Um, these are all things that I can level squarely at the government and I think we should remember because I'm going to watch as blame is being shouldered around everywhere and I'm going to remark on it. And hopefully again throughout Black Power 2020 as a festival, we'll have a chance to really, to really chop it up. I'm going to try something a little bit risky as well because hopefully the sound and all the technology works. It's always risky when you try and connect your phone directly to uh, whatever's happening, but this should be all right. So uh, bear with me. I'm going to try and connect some stuff right here. That's me posing. All right, so we've all seen this. I think it's worth seeing again. What are you doing? Circumstance. Okay, I'm really sorry, guys. I see what's happening. Hello, hello. We got more units coming. Okay, okay. Get up there. You move your leg. You move your knee from his leg. Get up my leg. You move your knee from his leg. Are you going to be here? I ain't done anything wrong. There we go. Get off my neck! Stay down, stay calm. Stay calm, stay calm. Okay, have you done anything? Stay down. Stay calm, stay calm. Stay calm, stay calm. Rob, it's not hard. Rob, Rob, stay calm, stay calm. Keep your hand up. You back up. Stay calm. Move back all of you. Stay down. As two arresting officers were forced to shut it. Rob, you're pinching his ear, bro. What do you mean, shut it, bro? Are you alright, bro? I'm recording this. Hey Rob! Hey Rob! It's cool! Hey Rob! It's cool! Relax! Relax! Rob, relax! 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 Relax!
for seeing black people brutalized on camera so I think I've had about enough of that but it ends with the man sitting up quite calmly talking to the other arresting officer about what happened. Apparently he's arrested um, on the suspicion of carrying a knife in public. I don't believe he was about to arrest or kill anyone with that knife. So just if you're buying a knife, the police have a, does this mean they have a precedent to stand on your neck and try and kill you? It's all very disturbing. But the reason I played it is because I want to draw attention to the ways in which this is viewed. And it makes me realize that we're not we're not reading the same books, we're not having the same conversation, we've not had the same experiences. And so when I quite naturally have this visceral reaction of horror and vexation, that even after George Floyd, British police officers are kneeling on the necks of black people, um, the UK constabulary, not for the first time, has a very, very different view. And I think it's gonna be good to have a listen. Run that ting. has been removed from operational duty following the arrest, which was on Thursday evening. You are stayed on. As two arresting officers were forced to shut it. Well, your pinching is here, bro. Well, you need to shut it, bro. The uh, Deputy Met Police Commissioner, Sir Steve Howes, has said the footage, and you can hear there it's all pretty chaotic, is uh, disturbing, extremely disturbing, he said. It had been referred to the police watchdog. The force has confirmed as well that it's charged a 45-year-old man with possession of a knife in a public place. Dal Babu is a former chief superintendent of the Metropolitan Police and is on the line. Now, morning. This is where it gets incredibly deep. To you. Uh, good morning. Well, when you look at the footage, what do you think? Well, I, th I think it's, uh, it's it's disturbing to see an officer uh, place a, a knee on and a neck, and that's not a, a official hold. It's uh, not part of officer safety training, uh, so it's wrong. It's, it's totally wrong. But I think we need to. I think it belies a hatred of black people. Yeah, I don't think you'd treat a dog that badly, but it seems like that's the way you'd restrain a dangerous animal, not a human being. And that's where it comes from. I don't think you need to train that, but it's just my opinion. Look at the context in which officers are being placed and the, the huge pressure officers are under. Uh, and they... Oh, he's under the pressure. Oh. Poor policemen. You know, we're all, I'm not saying that they're not under pressure and they faced cuts and job shortage, all sorts of, of drama. But come on, guys, have some perspective. How dare you say that you're going through things when black people are being traumatised every couple of weeks, every day, by a new video of a Karen going off or black people being murdered. And the fact that we're all, all black, white, rich or poor looking at serious uncertainty coming up over the next couple of months. I, I really haven't got time to, to feel sympathy for police officers who should be doing their job. Just saying. Basically, the officers were trying to detain somebody, and obviously, matters of judice. But we we have been told we were just going around doing some murdering, and it stopped. People interrupted our murdering process. That one individual has been arrested uh, after being in possession of a knife. So, so we need to look at the context that the officers faced. They were surrounded by a crowd that were becoming uh, increasingly agitated, and and the crowd was increasingly shocked that even. After George Floyd's murder, you have the audacity to try and kneel on a black man's neck in public, and they're recording it on their phones. So you're saying they, they're growing in agitation, and anyone who's not from your world will think they want to prevent a murder on the streets. Just, just saying. Continue. Hostile, uh, and the officers um, were trying to deal with that situation and with the crowd situation. But it also shows the difficulty that officers now have um, where they're being filmed and, and, and clips of footage will be shown which will indicate officers to be in a bad light. So, I mean, that couldn't get deeper than that statement really. Now the problem is that officers are being filmed. For most black people who've been witnessing what's happened over the past few years around the world, the smartphone it's been a boon. It's been a lifesaver. Literally, I've pulled it out in certain situations that have definitely seen a reduction in racial violence admitted towards me. 
if it hadn't been for what I filmed, then the whole pizza spectacle, National Express spectacle, would, this is just personal. So to hear a police officer complaining that they're being recorded is very interesting, very brazen. Like, you know, if you're doing your job properly, you shouldn't really worry about being recorded. Shouldn't have anything to worry about. Continue. It is really striking, isn't it, that the filming and the hostility as well, I mean, not, not many people, if any, are, are intervening to help. Exactly. I, I think there was one woman, I, I mean, I was shown this shot, uh, footage uh, when it first appeared a couple of a nights ago, and I noticed that there was one woman uh, who was trying to calm the uh, suspect down, uh, but the rest of the people were filming or being very, very hostile. I've been in a similar situation where I've been arresting uh, individuals and, and holding people down, and I've ended up being kicked in the face. Uh, so so these, these, these are difficult times. Did someone kick you in the face for 8 minutes 46 seconds? No? Well, shut up then. Officers would be very, very conscious that they have, they've been called to an incident of a fight, they've been called to deal with somebody um, uh, who, who has been uh, accused of an offence, and they'd also be conscious that they have got a crowd that are becoming increasingly agitated around them. So they have a risk in front of them, i.e. In the, in the individual, but they also have unknown risk with the crowd around them. Yeah, and I mean, a lot of people listening will be thinking, my goodness, I wouldn't want to go into that situation. But I suppose as well... I love that little summary of what most people listening will be thinking because it just again belies the fact that we live in very different worlds. You know, I suspect there are millions of people who tune into the Today programme and the like every morning who think, oh, goodness, I would hate to be surrounded by human beings not wanting to be murdered and protesting. Um, but it's the way that all these things are framed as if the people whose necks are being kneeled on and who are recording me trying to murder people in broad daylight, they're not real people. They're a crowd, they're a marauding mob. They're dangerous. They could kick you in the face. It's pretty batshit, frankly. It's pretty brazenly bonkers. Are trained, trained to go into that situation. Is, is there a training issue, do you think, potentially here? Uh, I think training is, is vastly reduced. I had the benefit of being uh, having almost six months residential training when I joined the police uh, in the 1980s, followed by having a, a parent constable taking me out in, in Tottenham and showing me the ropes. Uh, you know, these days, I'm afraid, we've lost 22,000 police officers. I appreciate there's a recruitment drive at the moment, but there are 22,000 less police officers, 18,000 less uh, police staff. You know, the police are having to do a lot more with less resources. But, but is there less uh, training as well? Yes, yes, the training. So you don't have the um, residential six-month uh, course anymore. You do a lot of the training on online. You have between six and eight, depending on where you are in the country, you have between six and eight weeks training before you then sort of go out independently. So it's a massive... Re yeah, I've heard about enough. So it's not an issue of a lack of training. It's not an issue of the funding cuts, all of which... Uh, are important issues. It is definitely to do with the culture within the police. Uh, we're talking about Anthony Walker, he's in the news again because there'll be a new televised drama about the fact that some kids hacked off the back of his head with a pickaxe. And that often gets lost in all this talk about how you can forgive and cope with trauma and how we need to let the past be, bury the past and all of this. Let's think what it took to kill Stephen Lawrence. Let's think what it took for one human being to pick off with a pickaxe to break somebody's neck and to literally stab them and hack the back of their head off. That's really difficult to do. It must be filled with a level of hatred that's almost inhuman, right? And as I've been traveling the country, again, looking at this 100-year-old history of race riots, certain things do resonate and hit you far more deeply than they would otherwise. Um, at one point, Charles Wooten is being chased down these streets that I, I drove and walked through myself. One man, a 24-year-old sailor, being chased to his death by mobs of up to four and 5,000 people. When you think about it, the optics of 20 or 30 black people being chased by mobs of up to 10,000 in London and Liverpool, it really makes you wonder. It really makes you wonder, how was that even possible? And then, when you read the official responses of the police and the courts, that's when you make the connection with what's happening now. I feared for my life, so I needed 10,000 people to chase one person into the sea and to drown them and pelt them with rocks. 
And the question is, we know what happened to these black people who were victimized and forcibly repatriated, sent back to the colonies against their will. What happened to the 10,000 looters and mob, mob? What happened to the 10,000 strong white mob that went around attacking like predators, innocent people burning down their houses? Many of them were not even given cautions, were let off lightly to say the least. And they went on to have children and their children had children and they still are there. They're still in Salford, in the hole, in Liverpool. Those attitudes, if they've never been confronted, are still there. They merely morph and change into something not quite as recognizable as it was before. So um, that's another thing that I'm really keen to draw attention to and to explore throughout the Black Pearl. But uh, you know what? I feel like I've been talking a lot. I'm gonna play another song. Uh, provided Ableton plays along with me. This is going to be a song, an untitled song as of yet. Let's go. One, two, one, two, one, two. Good. I'll be right back with the saxophone.
up so you can hear the thing. One microphone was damaged in the making of that last recording. Oh. <laughs> if you're in the comments, do let me know how you're doing and how you're feeling. If you've got any queries, any vehement disagreements with stuff that I said, please, this is the space, this is the forum to express yourself. I'm certainly not in any position to say my opinions are correct. Maybe only for myself. But they're certainly informed by my life I really hope that you're here to join me for that. And most crucially, if you want to partake in this festival, the tickets are now on sale. Ugh. Random dancing. Uh, do go to the website, soweto-kings.com forward slash Black Peril 2020, where apparently you can buy tickets. I've not even tried yet. I've been on and had a little look. That should be loud. participate in a festival. We won't be in the same room, but it affords an even greater degree of intimacy and a deeper way of engaging with the themes and the ideas behind the Black Peril. Every evening between the 14th of September and the 18th, ah, okay. from 7pm till 10, we'll be broadcasting bespoke performances from five cities in which race rights took place a hundred years ago. Hull, Salford, Liverpool, Cardiff, and London. Throughout this summer, British bridges, streets and squares that were once the scene of violent race riots in 1919 will be transformed into dynamic stages, plinths and galleries to creatively explore this past. It's easy to get the erroneous idea that today mobs of woke millennials are forcing society to confront diverse... Alright, so um, you can see that video on YouTube. I'll definitely post the link in the Facebook group afterwards as well as to this whole broadcast but picked up the message loud and clear there that over the background music you couldn't hear the announcement do go to www.soweto-kinch.com forward slash black peril 2020 and you can buy tickets right there i'm gonna be making nothing but announcements over the next uh, month and a half so um do get yourselves a ticket for the 14th of september and hopefully for the whole week so you can be part of us in this uh this ongoing discussion I do think, going back to the charge sheet, if you like, that I was talking about earlier, everything that I've witnessed has been a dis an attempt to dis distract and deflect from these charges. And they're very racialized. Over this past week, we've had the story of Leicester in lockdown, the past week and a half. Sweatshops, Asian sweatshops being the problem. We've had a lot of reporting about the third world and starvation there, and modern slavery. I don't know if I mentioned that already last week, but. I feel that whenever modern slavery is brought up, it's an attempt 
to sort of deflect away from historic slavery because they're very different qualitatively speaking. No one is ever today happy with the fact that people are exploited and not paid for any of their work. Back then it was considered legal and not just that, desirable, the natural condition for black people to be in, in bondage and servitude. So it's a huge difference there. Let's not get distracted, as I keep saying. Let's not allow the media, I think, to um, divert us away from some very powerful epiphanies and recognitions. Instead, what we've seen is all hail baby Wilfred this week. The Antichrist is born with a full head of hair. That's supposed to be news. Modern slavery, as I mentioned. China, Huawei, and TikTok. Stop using TikTok, it's communist. I'm just noticing, I'm not even going to drill down into these stories because they're all nuts. The police are under pressure from black people not wanting to be killed. Shamima Begum, Shamima Begum, that's a very interesting story because we're bringing it up again, always at points when the government is more or less on the ropes. But the idea that they could set a precedent to basically make people whose parents weren't born in the UK stateless, send them out of the country to a country they've never known because they disagree with some sort of values in our country, more likely because they're brown and black, right? There were white jihadis radicalized who've been back in the UK and faced trial, or some have probably assimilated and not been asked any questions. This is about the same poisonous cocktail of hate that was around in 1919. After a war, after the Spanish flu, let's not hold the government to account. Let's blame Bolsheviks and blame black people and the Chinese, and it's scary. Uh, how anger about Asiatics and aliens a hundred years ago is coming back around with such horrifying circularity. We need to talk about it. I've mentioned Lester, Blackburn, and Malvern. Um, and there's too many others to mention. But I feel like, again, it's an assault on the mind. Sort of render us not able to keep up and then we forget what we were even arguing about in the first place. Put the statue down, take the statue up, turn it diagonal. It's not really about statues. When I finish with this, the spectre of Mark Quinn um, is really interesting. And please do tweet, uh, look up on Twitter or research what's been happening. I haven't even got time to go into what the press attempted to do with Russia, the Russian report and Jeremy Corbyn. But with Mark Quinn, he's the sculptor, the London-based sculptor that created this black woman, um, why have I forgotten her name, Lee? Anyway, um, he created this poster, this, this statue which replaced the Edward Colston thing. And if you noticed, it was only up for a day before it was taken down, which definitely placed it in the realm more of stunt than of a serious political or historical intervention. The Bristol mayor was actually, it seemed risibly annoyed by the fact that he hadn't consulted any Bristolians about the installation. He just decided unilaterally to stick it up there and, and put it up in the middle of the night. And what's really troubling is that Mark Quinn has a history of using black women's bodies and not remunerating them for it. There was a woman who's been on Instagram saying vociferously how much she hates Mark Quinn for using her naked image, taking photographs and keeping them. She said she wants to have those images back and her use of her body back in that way. And he's refusing, which is pretty vile given where we are right now in the world. And I will say, Look out for those performative allies wherever they exist. It's easy to see how uh, they'll start to commodify black struggle and actually evade the wider need to change things. And what's happened is Aunt Jemima have taken the black woman off of the pancakes and Matt Lucas has apologized for blacking up, but no one's ever asked them, why did you feel the need to create that ugly image in the first place? Why did you need to denigrate black people who are beautiful and diverse and rich with a heritage and culture that has lit up the world for thousands of years? Why did you need to make them into minstrels and niggers? What, what's going on with you? The conversation is always, yes, it's a different time now. It's terrible, it's really embarrassed. Let's move on, let's just move on, change everything. And people try to jump out ahead and make all sorts of cosmetic changes. And the deeper question is, why are they doing it? Why, why do they need to create this evil in the first place? Why are they jumping ahead of it? And they're usually deflecting the deeper call for justice, not just for cosmetic change, but for real restorative justice. What reparations looks like, and it's not just checks for black people who didn't do any work. 
If you have a business that has profited from lies, be that Jemima, Aunt Jemima, Uncle Ben's rice, or the lots of stuff in this country, if you've profited as an organization, as a company, from dehumanizing black people, then how do you reverse that? You have to make paying black people profitable. You have to make it economically expedient to reward black people, merely for, for being here, for being alive and for surviving. And yes, it's a lot more complex than I can address in one live stream, but I'll say this. Whenever the conversation of re reparations, and I say it basically every week on this lockdown now, whenever the, uh, the, the question of justice and reparations are raised, there are all sorts of deflection tactics. And I think it's d destructive and harmful to all of us in society, not just black people, that we live and labor under these delusions where Boris Johnson is supposed to have our interests at heart. Well, we all know he doesn't. Thank you so much for tuning in and being part of this announcement, which I'll make again very clearly for my homette, Priscilla, and for Marianne, all right? The link to the event will be certainly in the Facebook group as soon as I finish chatting. I'm gonna post it straight up. And um, I'm gonna say it, it's soweto-kinch.com forward slash Black Peril 2020. If you've got comments, as I said, vociferous disagreements, please make them online on social media with the hashtag, hashtag Black Peril 2020. Uh-huh. Check it, check it, check it. Yeah, that'll be the link, Priscilla. Love y'all. Thank you so much for tuning in. So nice to see familiar, friendly faces. Marianne, could you repeat where we can get the tickets just one more time for the really slow ones at the back? So, you probably haven't heard me say this yet this evening, but um, I think now's as good a time as any to also talk about and flex this incredible artwork that's been created. Boom. If you didn't know, now you know, people. <laughs> Black Peril 2020 is available to purchase tickets at soweto-kinch.com forward slash Black Peril 2020. Forward slash Black Peril 2020, where you can buy either a day pass for five pounds or, which I'd recommend personally, a full week's pass to all the interviews, performances for just 20 pounds. And of course, we're finding a way with some arts council help to pay freelancers, filmmakers, dancers and musicians who are not able to work in venues at the moment. So do support our content. I want it to be really successful and as a model of music and art creation and bringing people together, I think it's gonna be really, really important. I mentioned really early on, I had two very edifying conversations today. One with John Z D, who might or may not be in the group. He's producing incredible work coming up soon and Adam from Jazz Refreshed, who's another stalwart, uh, independent, jazz-hearted human being. Incredible, incredible human being. So we, we're both chopping it up. With longer conversations, I think, than we, either of us intended. And I'm noticing that for creators, for content creators and people with integrity, particularly black people with integrity, it's time to share our work and share them with everybody. Rich, poor, black, white, yellow, everything in between. But to know that we have a platform for our work to be seen and taken seriously. And that's, if there's any sort of gift from this difficult time of lockdown, could be one. Uh, yeah, do go to that thing that I'm not quite able to, there we go, that way. Yeah, go there and check it out. It's online right now. You can buy tickets. So at o-kitch.com forward slash Black Peril. And I'll, uh, I'll see you there. I, you know, I don't want to give too much away, but we've got so much performances and dope stuff to happen and to come up that uh, I hope to see you all as part of this festival very, very soon. And uh, until that point, oh, I didn't even mention the artist, if you didn't recognize the incredible uh, creative who produced the album artwork for The Black Peril is a woman called Sophie Bass. Do go and follow her, Sophie Bass, on Instagram. And she's created another, she's done it again, another masterpiece, which as you can see, makes reference to the Edward Colston statue, makes reference to all the places that we're going to perform, the docks, this history of, of Britain and racial conflict, all communicated through motif and very skillfully done. And I've got to big up my brother, Ahmed Akasha from Design 237, who's been working with me since my second album, which is incredible when you think about it. So my brother from Another Mother has created all the graphics and we've been chopping it up all week. Um, this is just the time that we as creators can come together, build 
and hopefully get out to a new audience who might not have come to venues previously. So, uh, yeah, man, stay in touch, stay sane, stay sober, stay together, and uh, I'll see you next Monday. God bless. Mm -hmm.